The Hebrew scripture reading is from Proverbs chapter 8, verses 1 to 4 and 22 to 31. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up at, at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no, when there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he, assi when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. Thank you so much for reading. Thank you, uh, Miss Sarah. Thank you, Miss Jackie, for the, for the greeting. And thank you, for Mr. Lambert, for your help in running the service today. Good to see you all. I'm Mark Smiley. I'm substituting for Pastor Terry today while she takes a very necessary Sunday off. Terry was active at our United Methodist Annual Conference this week. She presented a resolution on bereavement leave for pastors. And uh, I could not believe the number of pastors who got up and told these stories about uh, grief and loss and trying to, to handle that while in the midst of, of serving a parish. Uh, Terry's motion passed almost unanimously. So thanks be to God for the work she did for us and for the church. I'm so glad to get Sarah's help today and to see the, the kids who were here for, for uh, church. Um, I remember when I was a, a, a young pastor, not that I'm not young now, uh, my, my, my older daughter used to come up while I was preaching or speaking and she would just kind of hold on to my leg while I was uh, uh, speaking. Uh, some people thought that was sort of disrespectful to have a, a kid up there roaming around. And uh, I got to tell you, because she was there, she is now a pastor. She spoke on the floor at annual conference this year in support of our district superintendents, did a great job. And uh, she was even given an award this year for getting new members in her church, presented by Reverend Dr. Bill Brown. So it was a family conference. We were grateful for, for all that went on. And... Uh, I'm so glad for, for uh, the work that this congregation and so many others have done to nurture our young people and bring them up along the way. Who knows what God is going to do with, uh, with the people we work with. Uh, I'm Mark Smiley. I'm a retired pastor uh, working full-time as a counselor, so I don't know how I'm retired, but that's kind of the way it goes. And I'm uh, delighted to be here today with all of you. So Sarah read about wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Wisdom, this, this, uh, this funny thing. What in the world is wisdom and what is Proverbs talking about? Uh, it's, it's interesting. At the first service, we read a translation of the Bible in which wisdom is referred to as lady wisdom, holy wisdom. Uh, the woman stands in the marketplace and declares these things. In Hebrew, the word for wisdom is feminine, and in Greek, the word is neutral. So we can't very well say he. It's, 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 God is beyond gender. It, it's just kind of fascinating how all this thing works together. But in any event, uh, Lady Wisdom wants us to learn a few things. Are you ready to learn a little bit today? From the ancient book of Proverbs, we hear wisdom calling for us. 
from the Advent Carol, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we implore wisdom to come. O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and cause us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Wisdom. What do we really need? Need a little more money? Need a little more stuff? Do we want some knowledge? What I believe God wants to give us, what will do us the most good, is a healthy serving of what Lady Wisdom has to offer us. What does wisdom look like? How can we tell what wisdom is? I, I wish I could tell you. All I can say is I know wisdom when I see it. I know a wise person when I see one. Do you know what I mean? Can you recognize wisdom when it's in front of you? Can you tell when you see a wise person? Do you just kind of know, get that feeling that this person really knows what they're saying? We think of a wise person as being old, but I've seen some pretty wise young people before. Wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is more than accumulating facts, solving equations, or winning debates. One can be smart, sure, but not necessarily wise. Smart and wise are not the same thing. One of my tasks as a mental health counselor is to somehow make a subjective call about the wisdom of the person with which I'm working. Can you imagine? It's a tall order, certainly open to interpretation, but I have to try. The words I am expected to use are insight and judgment. Insight and judgment. This is not about a person's intelligence or problem-solving ability. It's about their ability to see, understand, and interpret the actions and perceptions of themselves and other people. It's about their ability to use what most people call common sense, what grandma taught us. And yet insight, wisdom, uh, insight, judgment, and common sense are st st still only scratching at the surface of what it means to have wisdom. So how can I describe, if not define, wisdom, holy wisdom, theologically? Let me try this. To be wise, truly wise to me, means to somehow understand a part of the mind of God. To be wise is to know the best that God is calling us to be and to do. Today is also Trinity Sunday. The Trinity is frankly a bit of a head-scratcher. It's one of those doctrines of the church that I think we need holy wisdom to understand. Knowledge enough isn't plenty enough to, to know its meaning. To understand the Trinity, I think we need to use wisdom. So the traditional understanding of the Trinity is that God exists in how many persons? Three. As the Father, the Creator, the Maker of all that is, as the Son, the Redeemer, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, as the Holy Spirit, our sustainer, friend, and guide who is present with us even today. These three persons reference the same one and only God. There are not three gods, but one. No aspect is greater than the other, so there are three in one and one in three. That is the Trinity. Understand it? Oh, good. Next subject. Oh, you're, you're laughing. 
But perhaps that doesn't make it clear for you. We can speak of the Trinity in terms of analogies. Take water, for example. It exists in three forms. Help me out. Solid, liquid, and gas. Great. All three are the same thing. They're all water. But water takes different forms depending on forces such as temperature and pressure. So the forms are different, but the underlying substance, water, is the same. Another analogy for the Trinity is that of the sun. The sun is this great big ball of fire existing many millions of miles away. This is akin to God the Father, the Creator. The energy of the sun travels to us in rays. This is akin to Jesus, the way that we know God. When the rays of the sun reach us, we feel warmth. This is akin to the Holy Spirit, who works in us even today to stir us up and warm us up and set us on fire and lead us on the right path. Well, how's that for an understanding? Does, does that help? Still not satisfied? Are you about ready to change the channel on this sermon for something a little more inspirational? <laughs> okay, I have one last trump card. The Trinity is a mystery, a holy mystery. There, that ought to settle it. Or not. Perhaps your intellect or your soul is still not quite satisfied. I would venture that understanding the doctrine of the Trinity is not a matter of knowledge, of logic, of algebra. Understanding and living the meaning of the Trinity is a matter of holy wisdom. What glimmer of light do I see from holy wisdom about the Trinity? Perhaps it comes when I look out at you. When you look at each other, take a moment, look at each other, and take a moment, look at me. For me, the wisdom I see is that God exists in community. God is not alone. God does not desire to be alone. God wants to be with others, in relationship with others, even within God's self. When Christians go back to the creation story in the beginning of Genesis, we may hear echoes of the Trinity as God says, let us make humankind people in our own image. Who was this our. Some say that God is using the royal we, like the queen saying, we declare how important you are today. Others say God is speaking within the heavenly council. I wonder if God isn't speaking as the trinity, the three in one, the community, going back even to the beginning of creation. Friends, let us make us some people. Genesis 1, verse 27 says that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. What does it mean that God created humankind in, in God's image? Since it immediately says that God created them, male and female, perhaps the image of God itself is one of community. We as humans, male and female, are created to live in community with one another. Just as God, God's self, lives in community, so have we been created to live in community with other people. When we live in community, true Christian community with one another, loving, caring for, and respecting one another, 
Perhaps that is when we are most living in the image of God. God as holy community wants us to live in holy community with one another. That message to me is the greatest wisdom we can gain from the doctrine of the Trinity. Community. As I look especially at our youth and young adults, I see a tremendous value placed on community. Friends, relationships, and communications are exceedingly important. Look at the popularity of social media and how many peer, people here use social media of one form or another. If you really want to discipline a kid, what do you do? You take away the tablet or the cell phone, cut off the communication, and you'll get their attention in a heartbeat. Another way to see the value of community is via weddings. I haven't done any weddings in a while, but my, my observation through the years is that the wedding parties keep getting bigger and bigger. Eight, 10, 12, 14 attendants I've seen in some weddings. Today's youth and young adults place a tremendous value on community. Community is an essential need, I'm saying need, as people age. There are a lot of lonely older people out there. Once someone has retired, perhaps, or the kids have moved away, or a partner has passed, you know folks out there are getting very, very lonely. COVID. Oh, my Lord. My, the number of people calling me for counseling just went up stratospherically. People need each other. Community is essentially essential for those who are chronically ill. Some of you may be here or watching at home. Thank God we have this media, this social media, so we can connect. I know that most of you appreciate the love, concern, and help given by your family, friends, pastor, and church friends. I also know that some of you may feel a need to be left alone Sometimes you really don't feel like entertaining when you're sick. That's okay, but, but not forever. Be sure not to isolate yourself from other people all the time. I suspect that most of you are grateful for the community that your family and friends provide when they visit, call, and write you. Seeing their love and support may inspire you to do more to care for others in the same situation when you are ready and able to do so. Once you have received the gift of community, you treasure it. And you know how much it means to give it to someone else. Everybody needs community. Children, youth, young adults, middle adults, seniors, married, divorced, sick, well, working, under, unemployed, retired. Did I leave anybody out? We all need community. We all need other people. I expect that those of you who are here today or listening on your screen appreciate the value of having other people in your lives. That's why you're here in church today. That's why you're connected on the screen. The wisest thing we can do is to make the effort to have some kind of healthy connection and not be isolated from other people. But wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't community messy? Absolutely. We aren't always very nice to each other. Sometimes gulp. We're not so very nice ourselves. Yet for the triune God's sake, for the sake of the community of the Trinity, either we need to make the best of the community that we find ourselves in, or perhaps find a community that is healthy for us. We can't give up on community completely. We need each other as messy and messed up as we can often be. Finding a way to be in community with others is an act of holy wisdom as we live into the communal image of the triune God. 
If any of you have read the newspaper in the last few days and seen the word Methodist, we just had our United Methodist Annual Conference and had a bunch of churches, not a bunch, a small number of churches disaffiliate from the group. It was messy. It was difficult for all of us who were there. And yet, we know that we need each other. We need each other. We've got to give a little grace to each other and to ourselves. We can't isolate ourselves. We need to allow God to be in full communion with us. How, how simply can I say it? God really, really wants to be our friend. God wants to be our companion, our partner, our guide, our way. God wants, desires to be with us, to be present, to be an active part in our lives, my life, your life. God wants to be in community with us so much that God came, God's self as Jesus the Son, to live and die among us. But Jesus' death at the hands of those who hated community, who didn't want to be in community with love and peace and justice, killed him. But God raised death, Jesus, from the dead and sent the Holy Spirit so that we would always have God living in our midst. God really, really, really wants to be in community with us. It's no accident that we regularly practice Holy Communion with one another and with God. As we break this bread and drink from this cup together, we model the love that the members of the Trinity have for each other. May we share in this feast together and grow in love with each other and thus be truly wise. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Amen.